Well, good afternoon. Uh, as you're all aware, the uh, governor has vetoed two of the significant uh, bills that the legislative bodies worked on and got to the governor's desk in a timely manner. Uh, I've got to tell you that I am angry. I am deeply disappointed. Uh, I talked to or texted back and forth with the governor yesterday about the idea of meeting last night and just having a conversation about the whole process and uh, looking at what in the end is best for Minnesota, not what's best for the legislative branch, House or Senate, not what's best for the governor, but what is best for Minnesota. And unfortunately his flight was delayed and he couldn't leave DC and we were going to have a conversation this afternoon. I was shocked that he vetoed the bills without even the courtesy of that conversation. Uh, in the end, uh, it always is the governor's prerogative, but I would have appreciated that. Uh, I want to say that there were zero poison, bill, poison pills in these bills, which is something we worked very hard to make sure that we accommodated the governor with this year. There were some things that we were different on, but nothing that would rise to that level. Uh, in the end, it feels impulsive. It feels vindictive, and it didn't help anybody in Minnesota. I was hoping he would take that extra time even just to let the emotions of this whole conflict settle down a little bit. There's a lot of punching and counterpunching, and uh, it is the way it happens in divided government. And then you get to the end and the dust settles, and you, you sit back a little bit, and you look at the bills, and you look at who does this help, who does this hurt, not who wins and who loses. And if you look at who it helped, there were so many people in the spending bill that will now be impacted. It, it's over, it's, it's vetoed. There's not a special session. The House is not interested in a special session either, either but they're vetoed. And so the money that we needed for elections and security are, is gone. Uh, the money that we needed for DWRS, disabled workers, the, the people that work for them and needed, were, are going to get a 7% cut when they're already on the low end of what gets pay, what, what somebody should get paid is gone. The elder care abuse uh, that fr frankly lands squarely on the executive branch, squarely. Think about all the boxes and boxes of complaints that they weren't dealing with. And so we acted and we said, we're gonna deal with this elder abuse issue. That's gone. The opioid abuse issue that we all struggled to work on, the Senate passed fees, the, the House passed general fund money. Did it really matter whether where the money came from, but rather that we actually put money towards this? So there's no resources for places like Little Falls that actually had a program that was working to actually drive down the, the number of pills being prescribed and getting people off of opioids. Over 500 people in that community off of opioids and addiction. And that we were giving them resources so that they could multiply that same uh, solution, that same model across Minnesota, gone. Safe and secure schools, we all talked about the importance in that. S big, lot, large funding in two of those bills, gone. I will tell you, I hope he passes the bonding bill because that has another $25 million for safe schools. I hope he at least passes that. But everywhere we turn, somebody is impacted because in the end, uh, uh, we're too stubborn to give in and help Minnesota. And that, that just angers me to no end. So where do we go from here? I, I wanted to say, uh, you know, there was, I listened to part of the governor's uh, press conference, you know, and that it's all about politics and all about elections. I don't think that's fair. The Senate is not up for election. We're trying to get things done. I believe the governor was trying to get things done and I believe the House was trying to get things done. Is vetoing this bill, vetoing these two bills was really bad for Minnesota. Go to the tax bill. If you look at the tax bill, he kept talking about multinational companies are getting a break here. Oh, you mean like Cargill and Target and General Mills and Donaldson's and Echo Lab and all these great Minnesota companies that are great Minnesota citizens that contribute to all, th all kinds of things in Minnesota, these evil companies are getting a break. Well, first of all, that's not true. The federal government in the, 19, in the November change in the federal tax bill decided that they were going to deem foreign income as taxable. That meant 
income made overseas deemed or as though it was here and going to be taxed. But in return, the federal government gave a large reduction in corporate tax rates. There was a trade-off. So in Minnesota, the governor wanted to take all that deemed money, the money that was made overseas and still overseas, and give no corresponding uh, corporate tax rate in Minnesota. And so we ended up compromising with the governor and took some of it, about 55 million of that deemed income, income overseas, not in Minnesota. We took some of it. So corporations had a tax increase and individuals, almost all of them, either a tax decrease or level. We lowered the lowest tax bracket, we lowered the, the middle class tax bracket, and so that's where 99.8% did not get a tax increase. But it's, it is not true to say that the business community in Minnesota got a break, they paid more. And so if, if you look at those two bills, you just go, why? And it, it's, it's uh, some of the things I mentioned. But he also, we also, I know he was asked, well, what are some of the things that you were opposed to? And one of them was Minnesota Care for All. That's not out of that bill. That came out in the repealer bill. That was not in the bill. The 3.5% tax or the cybersecurity fee, uh, that basically said that Minute uh, could uh, charge 3.5% for cybersecurity to each agency when they're, when they're moving towards making those systems more secure. They could come back the next year then and request more because of that cost. So I, we didn't think that that was so great that we should veto the bill. So here's some of the things that are in the bill, and I believe you guys had a handout of all the things that we deleted off of the, off of in the negotiations. But uh, a simple thing, uh, Senator Dan Hall had a simple bill that said a local school district, if they so choose, could post the national motto, in God we trust. I don't think that's worth vetoing a bill. We said that if you want to, if you're in the left lane, you should be moving over because that should be a faster lane. And so we want that, that lane to move faster. Uh, another representative had a desire to have a civics class as part of the requirement for education training, that people would not forget how government works. Counties, uh, we wanted reimbursed when st what state auditor was suing them because they, if you recall, in the end, the auditor wanted all of that authority and we gave local counties the option to choose somebody else besides a state auditor because it was a lot less expensive. Well, then they started suing these counties and we thought that they should be reimbursed in those lawsuits. Uh, as mentioned, the money for cybersecurity wasn't exactly the way the governor described it. Uh, he talked about defunding HHS and I, I want to say that we reallocated HHS funding for DWRS, disabled workers, dis those helping disabled workers the federal government, how they interact with the state government, meant that there was going to be $18 million less money for those workers, which was a 7% cut. And we simply wanted to bring them back to where they were. And so we asked, and, and in the bill, it reallocated resources so that happened. We also had a rating system for schools so that parents could know what schools are doing well and what schools are not. It started as a five-star rating. We modified that. But that was that the modified language was in the bill. So I'm not sure what was so great that the governor would veto it for all of the things that I mentioned that were in the bill that everybody wanted. So I don't know where we go from here. I mean, the, these are vetoed. Session's over. We're moving towards the, the end of this year with the governor. I don't know where we go. We have another election, and that's going to be, I'm sure governor candidates from both sides of the aisle are going to be talking about what's important and what's not important, and maybe it will determ be determined there. But on, on the Senate's, from the Senate's point of view, I'm committed to working with whoever we have in the House, with the governor, but this has got to stop, and I'll end there. Any questions? So, Governor, did he contact you even after he announced this? Have no. You heard? Did you hear from him yesterday? Did, was it a two-way text? Yes. Text that changed? And he gave you no indication that the decision was coming? No. Okay, so many, basically, warnings that if you don't pull the stuff out of these bills and 
offer them separately that they get paid for Why didn't you do it? So if, if you look at a number of the bills that we did do separately that he, it was vetoed whether it was an individual bill, vetoed whether it was a big bill, um, whether it was the, the funding for deputy registers. Uh, he said, well, it's got to have Minlar's funding. Well, that was in the bigger bill. Uh, there, I mean, the protest bill he had ind indicated at one point that he would sign it. And as you see, we just had our light rail blocked again. We feel that that was important. Uh, again, that was vetoed. And so in the end, uh, part of it was about running out of time. And part of it was uh, that we wanted a bill that had so many good things in it with a few minor uh, policy provisions when you look at look at them that um, we thought that he would sign that. So. Was there ever a question to opioid, elder care, and school safety division? No, there was a lot of conversation about whether those should go separate or not. The one that uh, I can say there was a pledge to pass clean was the, the pension bill, and that happened at the very end. It, it did get done. Certainly, both the House and Senate, we, we both individually talked about what's the best way to get these through. Uh, sometimes it's about building consensus. Uh, sometimes it's about getting, in, in the Senate, about getting 34 votes to move something through. Uh, I can't speak for the House, but uh, you know, I was in some of the same breakfast meetings. Uh, there was absolutely conversation about it, but I wouldn't say it was something like, I give you my word. Those are... Uh, Fewer between. Uh, the governor has given me word, his word on about three occasions and kept it. When I give my word, I keep it as well. But not, I, I would say not in that one. Is it saying something that you guys aren't even on the same page of how things transpired or uh, what the facts are? I mean, isn't that indicative of you could have seen this coming? Yeah, I, it's obviously very disappointing. And that's why I wanted to give you the list of uh, all of the things that we were in disagreement about, about and all the things that we took out. Uh, in addition to the repealer bill, which took out more things uh, to try to get the governor to sign it. But I, uh, in the end, I can only control me and hopefully the Senate. Um, I think we all need to figure out how to work better together. I want to go back to the question I asked a moment ago, because you pointed to the seven bills he vetoed. He also signed 81 bills so far this session. So it's possible that he might have signed some of these things, at least the things that he liked that were in the bill. Why, again, I will ask, why not pull those out on some of them separate bills? Why do we have to have these gigantic 989-page bills? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. I'm, I'm open to looking at that in the future. How do we do it different? Um, uh, I know that Democrats, when they had the House, Senate, and Governor, did, uh, Senator Cohen did a very similar thing, but uh, there is certainly some benefit to doing it both ways. Well, the veto of the tax bill, how bad is it going to be for uh, Minnesota taxpayers early next year? So the Senate is the only one that's here next year in January for sure. We don't, we don't know whether the House will be Republicans or Democrats. We have no idea who's going to control it. We don't know who the governor is going to be. And so... It's our responsibility to get that bill done as soon as possible for conformity. I don't know that you could find a better bill than the one we just passed uh, because, of, as I mentioned, the, the lowest two tax brackets were lowered. And keep in mind, our lowest tax bracket is higher than 23 states' highest tax bracket. So we're trying to, we, we have a problem with our tax brackets and how we tax people in Minnesota. So. The fact that we're trying to lower those two a little bit, the middle class one and the low income one, uh, would benefit everyone. And so, you know, I don't know how that it would change at all from next year, but we'll see who the, who the governor is. Obviously, I hope it's a Republican governor, but uh, we'll see. Do we know what the net effect of the tax veto is going to be? Is it because there's no conformity? Is that going to be a net increase in revenue to the state? And do you have a problem with that if it's true? So first of all, the conformity was first about simplification. Uh, if we do nothing, the tax revenue does not change dramatically. If we had conformed, just simply conformed, Minnesota would have had a large increase in revenue, both for the, from the individual and the, the business community. So we are trying to avoid that. So now what we've got is uh, something where we have to do it right away in January. Otherwise, people are actually going to do two separate tax bill or tax filings, which will be more expensive and very complicated. And so our hope is that we get there right away. Uh, that's another reason it should have been done, uh, but, but it wasn't. 
How scared are you about <clears throat> the potential that Democrats take the House and rather than being a simple process to achieve tax conformity in January, it becomes another philosophical battle? I don't think it'll be any more difficult next year with a different governor and a different House than it was this year. This felt like the most difficult uh, of the two years. Last year we did pass a two-year budget uh, with tax relief for many people, seniors, small business owners, students with, or with student loans, uh, farmers had got a tax break and we passed transportation and education funding. We did a great two-year bill uh, that I think most people were very proud of. This year was just um, maybe a compilation of a number of years uh, of the governor being frustrated with the legislative branch. Uh, you can go back to when Democrats had the House and Senate with the governor. He had mentioned that Senator Box stabbed him in the back. Go back farther, and there was conflicts with Republicans. And so um, you know, it, it was difficult. And I, I understand that he was frustrated. It, it can be a very frustrating process. Uh, in the end, you don't get everything you want. Uh, the legislative branch certainly doesn't. Uh, the governor certainly doesn't. In the end, this time, nobody got what they wanted, and Minnesota is the one that suffers. When you and Speaker Dow left the room Saturday, um, Speaker Dow conceded that at this point it doesn't look like the governor will sign them. Do you feel like you did enough in order to satisfy the governor, or did at the end of uh, Sunday night until Monday morning, did you feel like you had taken a gamble? I, I would have... Uh, preferred to have, have uh, tried to have, I wish we'd had more time to negotiate with the governor at the end. It felt like if we'd had one more day that might have helped uh, uh, talk through, but in the end, some of the reasons that, that he didn't want to pass the bill were some of the reasons I just uh, handed out to you that we think were, were important just the same. And so, but another day of negotiation I think would have helped, but in the end we have a constitutional deadline. We had to get the bills to the governor uh, before that time said no special session that you had your chance for you to attempt to approach him about one anyway if there's a path ahead. So the governor said he doesn't want a special session. I don't think the House wants a special session either. Unfortunately, we have an election year. There's a lot going on uh, with the governor race and the House uh, race. Uh, that's what makes this so difficult because in the end, we don't, we should be doing these things. And I, but I don't know that we would be any farther down the road uh, a month from now or two months or three months uh, than we were right now. I think it was as close as the, the House and Senate could agree to uh, to get to the governor, and it was uh, obviously not far enough. So you see this as final? I do, I do see this as final. Mr. Leader, the governor seemed to at least kind of leave the door open for possibly a lame duck special session after the election to try to streamline the conformity process and make it a little easier going into the new year. What are your thoughts on that? Would you like to so, so I didn't hear them say that in the press conference, but uh, I would be open to that for the tax bill. The tax bill is a big deal for Minnesotans. I hope we get that done. You've been reticent to express anger before. As you're expressing it now, do you feel that perhaps you were too patient? You were, you were too forbearing? Or is your approach going to change going forward? No. Uh, I am who I am. Uh, I think this place works better with uh, honor and respect. Uh, we have, we have passionate people that disagree on all kinds of issues, but in the end, if you can't uh, have honor and respect, it, it's really hard to come to the, to the close. Uh, I'm not going to change uh, our, our way of doing it. I think the Senate, uh, I can only speak for the Senate, uh, but I think that's the way government should work. I think, did you believe that the governor did not, did not operate with respect to the cases in this? No, I... I'm not going to comment about that. Did you have problems negotiating with the House? I'm not going to comment about that. On a slightly different subject, what do you think about uh, the egg chairs proceeding with their uh, delay of a nitrate rule? Well, the, ex the legislative branch has its unique powers and the executive branch has its unique powers. And th that's the, the, uh, the wonder of our divided government and, and branches of government is that it, no one uh, branch gets to make all the shots. And so uh, you see that, that tug of war going on. We, we in the legislative branch think that we have gone too far with regulations and, well, taxation I already mentioned. And so where we can insert ourselves for Minnesotans, for farmers and uh, miners up north and municipalities with their wastewater, we're going to insert ourselves. And so it is where you have a tug of war when you have two strongly held views that are quite different from each other, and 
Unfortunately, we saw that collision uh, in the last few weeks. Okay, so answer my question. What do you think of the nitrate action? Is that good? Should they proceed on delaying it? Uh, I, I think that the, the uh, Senator Weber and, and his movement forward from the ag community has every right to do it, and I support his decision to do it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. I hope not to see you again for a while.